Hey everyone, I'm Eddie Joe. I'm an intensivist who loves to take a deep dive into clinical research and also the host of the Saving Lives podcast. So I'm actually going to be posting this on the Saving Lives podcast as well. And let's see, let's see how it all works out. Today I'm going to be discussing an article that was published in the March issue of Critical Care. It's this one right here. And it was published on March 13th to be exact. It's titled Early Adjunctive Methylene Blue in Patients with Septic Shock. A randomized control trial. Uh, I speak Spanish, so that's why I can say that properly. All my friends in this, uh, I say friends hypothetically because these people aren't my friends necessarily, but my Mexican friends who published this paper, they put together a small randomized control trial looking at the utilization of methylene blue. Methylene blue has been around forever as an adjunctive to vasopressors in patients who are in septic shock. And I have to say, my first bias, I really like this trial. I always like using medications that we already have been using for years. We know what the adverse effects are, things of that nature for new indications. We are very comfortable utilizing methylene blue in patients who have post-op vasoplegia uh, after having cardiac surgery, for example. So that's my first bias. I like these types of medications. The second bias has to do with the fact that Glenn Hernandez is one of the authors of this paper. Now, for those of you who don't know, Glenn Hernandez is a legend in the space. He actually published the Andromeda Shock Trial, which is one of my favorite publications ever. I'll send the link, uh, I'll place a link down to the Andromeda Shock Trial because I've discussed it before on a post that I did about lactic acid and management of lactic acidosis down in the show notes. But basically, the, what they did in that trial, the Andromeda Shock Trial, is that they recruited patients who were in septic shock and they either did serial lactates on these patients or did uh, capillary refill testing on them and basically resuscitated patients based on either lactate or capillary refill testing. And although the big picture was that there was no difference in some of the outcomes between the two, well, I don't know about you, but I'd rather have my finger pushed down on rather than drawing my blood to try to figure out what my lactate levels are. But all that aside, Glenn Hernandez is the, the lead author of that. He's also running the Andromeda the Andromeda Shock 2 trial right now, which is ongoing. And he's also a nice guy. I am actually uh, actually have a connection with the guy through Twitter. Every time I ask a guy a question, he's quick to respond, very friendly, very pleasant. So those are my bias, uh, my biases with regards to, uh, regards to this trial and actually the authors of this. So one of the other reasons why I'm such a fan of the Andromeda Shock 2 trial, excuse me, Andromeda Shock trial, actually carries over to this particular trial on methylene blue and it has to do with the way that they assessed fluid responsiveness on their patients who had septic shock. In other words, they were not giving patients just IV fluids willy-nilly. Hey, 500 cc's of LR, let's see what happens. No, they were being very methodical, very careful, doing the best that they can uh, when it comes to resuscitating patients who are in septic shock. So they're quite sophisticated in what they did. But before I continue, I'd like to recommend you to read the article for yourself. It's actually free for you to download. The citation is down in the show notes because this is not medical advice. I'm not telling you how to practice. And again, these are very preliminary data for which the authors are calling for more data, more people to do a larger randomized control trial on methylene blue. At this time, I'd also like to do the cheesy YouTube thing and ask you to go ahead and leave a like button if I teach you absolutely anything during this particular video. Uh, leave a comment if you have a question. I'll try my best to answer it for you. And if you have not subscribed to the channel yet, please go ahead and do so because it helps this content as well as all my other content reach larger, larger audiences. So let's talk quickly about how the typical sepsis management goes. So a patient shows up during sepsis, they get blood cultures, antibiotics, fluid, they get their lactates checked, um, you know, all the typical things that we do. If the fluids do not restore the patient's perfusion and restore the map of 65, the magic number that we have all chosen, well, then the patients go ahead and receive norepinephrine as their first-line vasopressor. This is, you know, surviving sepsis guideline stuff. If the norepinephrine is not cutting it, then we go ahead and we add vasopressin. The threshold at which vasopressin is added is currently being debated, but I'm not going to get into this to nitty gritty management of sepsis in this particular video, but obviously it's more complicated than that. But generally speaking, that's, that's what we go ahead and we do. And this is where methylene blue comes in because what if there is a tool that we already have in our toolboxes, we already stack, we already have like 
contracts with manufacturers. We know it's cheap. We know it's readily available. We know what its side effects. What if there's things of this nature that are available that are sitting on ourselves in our pharmacies and our hospitals? Wouldn't that be quite helpful? Because we already know, as I mentioned before, that methylene blue does help treat patients who have post-op vasoplegia. Whenever I'm teaching people uh, shock, you know, I ask them for the four types of shock and, you know, they say cardiogenic, hypovolemic, uh, septic. We all know that septic shock is actually falls under the subcategory of distributive shock and post-op vasoplegia also falls under there. Just that a lot of people don't take care of patients after open heart surgery. So that's why it kind of falls off the radar. But I will say the obstructive shock is very, very frequently forgotten, <laughs> but that's as a, that's a different, different process there. But something that is in common between patients with septic shock and post op vasoplegia is that their whole nitric oxide uh, synthesis, redistribution, all that stuff just goes a little bit haywire. So the whole idea here is that methylene blue helps keep that under control and then makes the patients restore their normal uh, vascular tone. And that's how they benefit from these particular treatments. On my website where I discuss methylene blue, I have reviewed two different studies, one which, was, one which took place in 2001, another one that took place in 2002, where they kind of gave methylene blue as like a last ditch effort. But here they're doing it early in the course of the patient septic shock. And again, I'll go through that in a little bit. So from a mechanism of action standpoint, to quote the paper on what methylene blue does, because <clears throat> I can't seem to put this into my brain, Methylene blue is a specific inhibitor of the inducible nitric oxide synthase, as well as soluble guanylate. Yep, I said that correctly this time, cyclase. And so what this does, as I mentioned before, is that it restores the normal behavior of the blood vessels when there's too much nitric oxide going around and therefore causes a vasopressure-like effect. We already had inklings that this worked based on those data from 2001 and 2002, but it kind of went away. It's, it fell out of favor. More people didn't do research on it uh, for whatever reason that I'm not going to get get into here. But thankfully, it's 2023 and this is starting to come back. So now it's time to explore the paper. And let's, let's start taking a look at what took place on this clinical trial, which again, I definitely recommend you read it for yourself as I undo my iPad here. If I can remember my passcode. No, I can't because, you know, but... This is the paper here, definitely easy to go ahead and get. I don't know if you were able to see that because of the glare. Sorry. Anyway, this was an investigator-initiated parallel double-blind randomized controlled trial, and it was performed at an academic institution, one center, just one center in Mexico. And the particular unit that they did it on was in a med surge ICU. By definition, these patients had to be in septic shock. They also enrolled these patients early, within 24 hours of presentation. And one of the things that we have to be very, very cognizant of before we even start thinking about patient, giving patients methylene blue is, or what are their home meds? Like, what are, what are they taking at home? And the reason why is because when you have patients who are on SSRIs, you know, antidepressants such as Prozac, such as uh, generic name is fluoxetine, if you have patients on uh, Zoloft, etc., then this interacts with methylene blue and then it causes serotonin syndrome. And then not only do you have a bad time because of your sepsis and septic shock, but then you also have serotonin syndrome, which is not good for our patients. So for example, when we provide methylene blue for our patients in the cardiovascular ICU, well, there we always review the med list because obviously these people are admitted 95% um, of the time they're not emergent. But we have a good idea of what their what their home meds are and we can not give methylene blue if they are if they are on SSRIs. There are other exclusion criteria for which patients did not get enrolled in the trial, but read that for yourself because we'll be here forever. And I know that you're trying to get out and I've already been rambling for almost 10 minutes. Holy cow. So let's talk, talk next about the dosing of methylene blue. And here the dosing is different than what they usually use in patients in the cardiothoracic ICU. Again, the reason why it's using the cardiothoracic ICU is for post-op vasoplegia, which is usually self-limited, uh, lasts about six hours, sometimes a little bit longer, but we all know that, the, that sepsis and septic shock lasts longer than six hours. These people are sick for longer periods of time. So what they did here is that they infused 100 milligrams of methylene blue, and they let that run over six hours. 
and they did this for three days on these patients. So this was in addition to the normal sepsis management, you know, fluids, antibiotic source control, all of those, all of those things. And I have to, again, tip my hat to the people who wrote this study because of how they assess fluid responsiveness. They did a fantastic job. They did echocardiograms with certain measurements. They looked at pulse pressure variation, excuse me, tidal volume challenges, as well as respiratory variation of carotid peak flow velocity. When it comes to that last one, I can't say I'm an expert at that. I've never done it before. But in other words, this is the best resuscitation that we know how to do today. And these authors did it. So definitely my hat tip to them. They were able to enroll a total of 91 patients in the study. And this was not a huge amount of study. Again, they were just trying to, you know, tease out, tease out what would happen. But when you look at some, some of the outcomes, this is not enough to power the study appropriately for certain outcomes, such as mortality. And this is why the authors recommend that a larger randomized controlled trial be performed to go ahead and prove this and to power the study appropriately to find a better result. So let's go ahead and look at the outcomes. This is what we're here for. The primary outcome was the time to vasopressor discontinuation in hours. And this outcome ended up being statistically significant. Here they found that the methylene blue group had vasopressors discontinued at a median of 69 hours. The control group, however, had a discontinuation at a median of 94 hours. So a lot longer period of time for the patients in the control group. The secondary outcome was vasopressor free days at 28 days. And here the methylene blue was also beneficial where the median was 23.9 vasopressor free days versus 19.5 in the control group. This gave a median difference of one day. Right off the bat, without looking at the secondary outcomes, one can deduce that the ICU length of stay should be shorter in the methylene blue group. Now we don't know how much an ICU day costs. Well, we don't, but it costs a lot of money. Just take it that way. As the patients got out of shock earlier, one would hope that the cumulative fluid balance would end up being less in the methylene blue group. And this also ended up being true. Turns out that the mean difference in the amount of fluids that the methylene blue group got from the control group was about 750 cc's. So that's pretty good. And there was no difference in the duration of mechanical ventilation, um, statistically speaking, but there was a trend towards the benefit there. But there was also a trend towards the benefit in mortality. Although, again, speaking in honest statistics, this is not statistically, this is not powered for uh, for a benefit and the difference in mortality was not statistically significant. It was pretty clear cut though that there was a improvement in the ICU length of stay with the median being 1.5 days shorter in the ICU compared to the control group as well as the hospital length of stay which was 2.7 days shorter uh, speaking on a median scale. Now I really need to get back to the mortality outcome. These clinicians did a fantastic job of identifying these patients and starting them on the appropriate therapies very early in their course. In addition, they used the absolute best technologies that we could do to assess for fluid responsiveness. I mean, I don't know of, realistically speaking, I don't know that the vast majority of, of, uh, of intensivists are doing echocardiograms on all these patients. and pulse pressure variation and uh, these other other things that we should be using, right? A lot of clinicians are just going, eh, they kind of need 500 cc's, they give them 500 cc's and call it a day. That's that's really not the way we should be practicing medicine. But despite, despite this optimal fluid resuscitation, optimal management, they still found that the control group had a mortality of 46% in these patients with septic shock, which is kind of mind blowing. Recently in 2015, 2016, there were three trials uh, that looked at fluid resuscitation in different manners, which were the PROMISE process and ARISE trials. And all of these showed mortalities between 20 to 30%. But one of the things you need to consider here is that the Apache scores, Apache tells us the severity of illness of these patients. The Apache scores here were higher than what they enrolled in, for example, the PROMISE trial where they had approximately 30% mortality. So it's just something to keep in mind before you try to criticize this group for having such high sepsis mortality. But despite what the patient's Apache scores are, we need to think about the patients that we each take care of in our respective institutions because, you know, we don't, I don't know about you, but I'm not keeping track of Apache scores on my patients. But nonetheless, 
if if we're doing all this good work and we're trying our best and we're still having 40% mortality and sepsis, man, that's high. We haven't made a lot of progress over the course of the last 20 years. It's, it's honestly disappointing. What they did find is that the methylene blue group had 33% mortality as I got a hair on my nose um, at 28 days, which is better, but again, it wasn't statistically significantly better. This is why we need larger studies. So looking at the limitations, you know, the authors will tell you what all the limitations are. This is why I definitely recommend you read this article for yourself. Again, it's free for you to download, but there were limitations to their work. This is why you need to do larger, larger trials on this. Looking at the adverse effects, this is where, um, this is what we always have to consider. First things first, for anybody who's given methylene blue before, you know that your patient's urine is going to turn a different color. It kind of turns this bluish greenish, uh, this bluish greenish tint. And here they found that to take place in 93% of patients, which what actually like makes me laugh about that though, is that when they do do the larger trials, when they do do, here we go again, I'm a child. Um, when they do perform the larger trials, they're going to have to hide the urine bags or the Foley catheters or wherever they collect the urine because you're going to be able to tell uh, which, which, which patients are the placebo patients and which patients are the methylene blue patients just by looking at their, at their urine. And that's going to you know, lead, the, lead the trial to be open to more bias. But sorry, I have a little bit of a cold. So one of the things that they did find was a difference in the hemoglobin levels of the patients, but this does not change their, their clinical outcomes. In addition to that, there was no change in the ejection fraction, the PF ratio, and the kidney function, or the liver function. So all that was good stuff. So to wrap all this up, and I, I really have to commend these authors for exploring a relatively inexpensive therapy to treat patients with septic shock and get them out of septic shock faster. There is a new therapeutic out there, which I don't necessarily want to poo-poo on because I haven't used it, but facts are facts that it's expensive and that's called angiotensin II. Uh, so therefore, a lot of institutions don't have access to it. If you, you know, you got to think about uh, countries that don't have all the resources, for example, that I have available to me in the United States, and they might not be able to uh, afford angiotensin II versus methylene blue, which they probably, probably already have in stock. But... I'm always intrigued at using old, readily accessible medications and therapeutics to take care of something that is taking as many lives as unfortunately sepsis is today. More research on methylene blue is definitely necessary, but I honestly think that this is a fantastic step in the right direction, and I really look forward to hearing more about this. I definitely thank the authors for conducting this study, and I hope you guys learned something from this video. If you did, leave a thumbs up. Hope you have a great day, guys. Bye.